I wanted to welcome you all to the Nashby Annual Conference. Um, so great to have you with us here virtually. It was fantastic to hear from Governor Lujan Grisham and our experiences in New Mexico. We are now gonna hear um, about three additional states, Massachusetts, North Carolina, and Utah. And we have a fantastic panel planned for you all today. Um, this discussion is really gonna center around um, how states have led the COVID-19 response and mitigation efforts and how they're planning for recovery. There was a lot of work underway um, with states um, before the pandemic. How is that work continuing? What are emerging challenges? And how can we think about um, federal funding and other resources to help support these efforts? So I'm now going to introduce you to our um, three panelists, which I'm so pleased to have with us here today. We have Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. Um, she serves as the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, overseeing 12 agencies and Mass Health with a combined budget of $24 billion and 22,000 public employees delivering essential services that touch the lives of one in four state residents. In March, 2020, she was appointed by Governor Charlie Baker to lead the state's COVID-19 Response Command Center. Um, next up is uh, Secretary Mandy Cohen. Um, she was appointed to her role at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services in January, 2017 by Governor Roy Cooper. Um, Secretary Cohen and her team worked tirelessly to improve the health and safety and well being of all North Carolinians. Um, DHHS has 17,000 employees and an annual budget of $20 billion, um, serving as the home to North Carolina Medicaid, public health, mental health, IDD, SUD, state operated hospitals and facilities, economic services, adult and child services, early childhood education, employment services, and health services regulation big agency. Um, and Dr. Cohen has really led the COVID-19 response for the state of North Carolina. And they oversee the operational response, including hospital surge capacity, testing capacity, tra tracing capacity, and PPP availability. In addition to constructing the advanced data infrastructure necessary to collect and analyze key data points to drive decision making. And third, certainly um, last but not least, um, is Nate Checkets, who is the executive director for the Utah Department of Health. And he is also the deputy director at the Department of Human Services. And Nate has a long history um, with Utah and in addressing the COVID-19 response and mitigation efforts in Utah. He coordinated Utah's COVID-19 testing efforts for the first year of the state's pandemic response. He was also Utah's Medicaid director and helped design and implement Utah's version of Medicaid expansion. He has previously been Utah's CHIP director, a budget analyst in the governor's office of planning and budget, and a senior auditor for the California State Auditor's Office. So, so pleased to have all of you here today. Um, I'm gonna start with just um, a general question for each one of you and really would like to hear how things have been going in your state. So, so first of all, thank you for all your incredible work during this pandemic. I know it, it is ongoing, um, but it has been such a challenge over the past 18 months. As you reflect on where each of your states have been, what were the most significant challenges and lessons learned? And how are you able to think about recovery while you're still in the midst of continuing to respond to the pandemic? And Secretary Sutters, I might start with you. So if you don't mind. Well, thank you. Um, it's good to be with all of you virtually. I actually do look forward to the day we can all be physically present with one another. Uh, thank you, Hemi, for um, all the work you do to bring states and our colleagues together. Um, you know, as I think back about this almost 19 months, uh, today, Massachusetts is in a very different place than it was uh, in the early days of the pandemic. Um, you know, we're now a, sort of a national leader in terms of vaccine administration. If you'd said that to me 19 months ago uh, when I was trying to work my way through PPE, which became my favorite four letter word, if you would, um, uh, and the like, uh, I'm not sure we would have, you know, I would have said that. So uh, just to put a little perspective where we are at this moment, um, just about 75% of our entire population has at least one dose of vaccine and 87% of our adults being 18 and older have had one dose uh, and 86% of 12 plus have at least one dose. So we have um, vaccines. So we are, um, and we, we don't say that to boast. We use those numbers as a way to really lean in harder um, with those individuals that we still need to reach uh, to be vaccinated in as many channels and opportunities as possible. Um, but as I go back, you know, the Northeast, the two coasts were hit very hard, very early. 
uh, in uh, COVID. In uh, you know, our first case was February 1st of 2020, um, which seems like a lifetime ago, uh, and then followed very quickly by, by what everybody remembers now probably uh, as the Biogen Conference. Um, which um, really sort of spread very quickly and reminded all of us of how fast um, uh, COVID traveled. Uh, it hit very hard in our nursing homes, our skilled nursing facilities, and I can talk about what we did um, to really try to stabilize and manage. You know, almost a third of our deaths in Massachusetts occurred in skilled nursing facilities, and it's uh, uh, a tragedy uh, that we will never forget and lessons learned. The, um, for us, um, our strength in Massachusetts has been our healthcare community. And early on, uh, the governor and I, uh, so the governor asked me to be his command center director. I'm not exactly sure what I knew when I signed up to do that. Of course, I was not gonna say no to the governor, um, but was to really mobilize all the resources. Uh, necessary. Uh, in a matter of weeks, we probably, I was counting um, Mandy, uh, we probably put out uh, 24 either gubernatorial orders or public health orders in a period of, of moments of trying to stabilize. Uh, and throughout this, we've had three primary objectives. One was to um, preserve our healthcare system. Uh, the second was to um, preserve life, of course, and the third was to um, achieve equity, uh, even in the very earliest days of the pandemic, knowing that there were uh, individuals and populations and cities and uh, communities that were would be disproportionately impacted because of structural racism and the like. Um, honestly, I would just, um, for all of you out there, there was no playbook. The playbook we relied on, honestly, was our colleagues in other states. Um, uh, uh, Mandy and I certainly were on speed dial to one another, but there are a number of other states. Governors reached out to other governors. Um, I think we realized we were alone. States were alone. Um, that may sound dramatic to people, but I think we received most of our support and guidance in the lessons from other states, uh, um, uh, sharing ventilators, um, literally from the state of New York, uh, understanding how to set up mass vaccination sites, sharing you know what we did and did not, you know the lessons on how to do that, mobilizing our national guard. Um, these were all uh, lessons uh, where we reached across to other states um, on what was working in their states, and you know frankly some things we missed that we learned uh, midstream. I think, uh, honestly, for us, um, you have to be, uh, you're humbled by a pandemic. And one of the things as leaders, we became quite comfortable, uh, uh, however uncomfortable it may seem, is standing up in front of cameras, being calm, and saying what we knew and what we didn't know. Uh, being willing to admit when we uh, implemented something that perhaps didn't work as well as it should and admitting to that. Um, the, uh, and I think we, we became the governor um, uh, and I uh, in almost daily briefings in front of the press, you know, uh, with people wanting answers to questions that we just didn't have in the early days, you had to be very comfortable um, or uh, at least not scared of saying, we don't know, and there will be more information soon. Uh, and frankly, one of uh, our lessons, two lessons was, one, you had to be nimble. Um, people are really tired of, in Massachusetts of hearing me say, we have the need for speed. We needed to become comfortable making decisions with incomplete data. Uh, and that meant you then needed to be willing to sort of pivot as more data became available to you, not reckless, but that as data changed, uh, and that as we know from this pandemic, um, the one thing we know about it is continually evolves. Uh, and so you have to be comfortable being willing to say, you know, we're, we're heading in a different direction, a different direction. Um, and then secondly, 
uh, being, um, you know, uh, some people would say I, I've stepped on many a toe, at least according to page one of the Boston Globe. But, you know, um, whether it was moving vaccines around, um, doing everything possible to create PPE supply channels in our state, uh, working with our colleagues in other states, uh, setting up mass vaccination sites, setting up field hospitals. Um, this pandemic really forced all of us to think very creatively and continue to think very creatively. So as we come through now the Delta variant and thinking of our recovery, it is how do we open up our economy, keep our schools open, keep people safe, prepare for boosters, and move forward in whatever that new normal is. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, Dr. Cohen. Well, great, first, Amy, thanks for having me. And Mary Lou, I, I learn something new every time I, I hear you recount what's happened and it has been um, a comfort to not be fully alone because I had you on speed dial and other health uh, leaders around the country, but this was a, a really uh, scary time for, for us all. And what I wanted to share at the, at the start with other state leaders is that I, when I, I thought about jumping into this crisis, I thought about trust from the very first second we were getting into this because trust was foundational to everything we were able to achieve. Um, and I thought about how do you build trust and how do you maintain trust because we know trust can get broken so quickly. Um, and so um, right from very early on when I mobilized our team and we sort of knew what was ahead of us, um, we talked about it very intentionally about trust um, because this, this crisis relied on us um, needing to partner so deeply in so many ways. And you can't truly partner without that trust. Um, we needed to partner with every individual in North Carolina to help them understand that they needed to move through the world in a different way. They needed to trust that the data and the science we were talking about was needed to change their behavior. Um, and I'd still say we're on that journey still. Um, and, you know, I, North Carolina is a particularly unique state um, where, you know, it's a, a purple politics state, but it's ur urban rural divide. We have incredibly diverse um, in terms of um, race and ethnicity. Um, and so there's a, there is a lot of mistrust in our state of institutions, of science, of media, of each other, of, of, of other. And um, that was very intentional from the beginning. And I think to be successful as state leaders, you need to think about that trust. So as another critical lesson, as I was saying, is it was that partnership. Um, and I wanna echo what um, Secretary Sutter said, which was the, the healthcare community was just tremendous during this time. And I really wanna praise particularly our, our hospital systems really stepped up in big ways here. Um, I've never seen the kind of collaboration across competitors, because remember, these are often competitors, um, come together to share, whether it was PPE or testing or take, a, take patients. We set up an entirely new patient transfer system that we are using right now as we are in the midst of, of this Delta surge. Um, and it was trust, right? Trust amongst competitors that really helped that happen, as well as when we got to our mass vaccination efforts that we all had to go through at the beginning of 2021, it was, we really leaned on our hospital systems because they could go to scale quickly um, and that partnership had been built. The other what so, so critical was data. Um, because we, we needed to make decisions so quickly, it was so critical for us to have the best data. Now it was often incomplete, particularly at the beginning, but for us to really work rapidly to build data systems that would give us the best understanding and picture of what was happening. Everything from where is our PPE, right? Just data about weeding track where PPE was in the war, to where do we have tests to where are our community health workers, where are our gaps of pharmacies that I now know very well. Um, uh, the, the, every type of data to help inform our decision making. And I will still say we have a lot more to go to and I'm sure we'll get into discussion. Um, I wanna reinforce the point um, Secretary Sutter's made about the communication, how often we needed to communicate daily. 
repetitive communication um, was so, so critical um, because we were asking for such big behavior changes in folks. And we all know behavior change is so hard. Um, and again, but for us, it also went back to that trust being willing to stand in front and, and answer questions day after day, hard questions in a calm way um, to tell folks what you did and what you didn't know. Um, and that transparency fostered a lot of trust building um, and that I think that helped us uh, move forward. And then um, lastly, uh, the two things to, to mention on, on equity and on focusing on a whole person uh, care that I know we're gonna get into you know, whole per person health was something we were very focused on before the pandemic. And I'm so grateful because we had some infrastructure built and some, we de-siloed a lot of our agency already. And we sort of accelerated that. And I, I know we'll get into that more, but really thinking about the, it, it wasn't enough to get someone access to a test. Then they needed somewhere safe to isolate at home and not every, and if someone's not at work, that means they can't pay rent and they couldn't leave their house to go get food. And right, so very quickly we got into this, um, that everyone experienced that we know it wasn't about an insurance card or it wasn't about even getting that, that test done. It was about all of those wraparound pieces. And so it just became so clear that to handle any public health emergency, we have to be thinking much more than just what's the medicine, what's the test. Um, it is about that that broader picture of of health, um, and we were grateful to um, be able to put, you know, really expand the things we had been working on before COVID. And lastly, on equity, which I know everyone is working on, and frankly, I learned a ton of lessons from Massachusetts on. But it starts with having good data because you can't if you can't measure the problem, you can't solve the problem. And so many folks have so much missing data that you really don't know what you're dealing with. So very early on, we made it absolute requirements to capture race and ethnicity data. You can't, can't do a test here and report it in North Carolina without capturing race and ethnicity data, nor can you give out a vaccine without capturing it. We have um, less than 1% missing race and ethnicity data, which is unheard of. And everyone said, you can't, you can't expect 99%. You can. And it's important because it really did help us get incredibly nuanced with our resource allocation when you have really good data. Now, it's, it's, we don't have a lot of good data on so, so many things around testing, but if it comes into us, it has raised an ethnicity data. Um, so, but I would say that we know that this that equity is so much more than measuring the problem, um, but that is absolutely foundational. And, and we, we all have to rapidly move to a place where that is absolutely the baseline. And so that we can use our time and our resources to target, to, and, and we're gonna have to do our work differently if we actually wanna close these equity gaps. So for example, us in Medicaid, we are paying um, primary care um, office uh, offices that have a higher proportion of, um, folks from historically marginalized communities. If you have a hard, larger population, we give you extra money because we know that there are resources needed to close gaps. Um, and then and they use the, that those extra dollars um, to make investments on the equity front. So we use our data to know where, where folks are. We use our data to say, look, this is what works and like, let's put our resources behind it. Um, so I, I, th I think that is one silver lining of all of this is that focus on, on data and, and equity um, that I know I, I'm, I'm hopeful will continue well into the future. I'll stop there. I'm sure we'll get into more. Thank you, Mandy. Um, Nate. Um, I will turn to you next. Thank you, Hemi. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this discussion. And thank you, Secretary Setters and Cohen, for those uh, great words and uh, discussions of this topic. Uh, like Secretary Setters, uh, one of the things that we faced in Utah early on was uh, significant shortages related to essential uh, equipment and services. We thought we were prepared for uh, that for these types of infectious diseases, but as many of us quickly experienced, our resources were insufficient. We had a PPE in our warehouse, but quickly found that it was five to 10 years old and had come from a previous uh, response and that had still been sitting there and had not been refreshed. Uh, we found that our supplies were insufficient as the supply chain quickly broke down across uh, the world. Things that were basic for our response were not available. Uh, I remember early as our state lab was trying to conduct what now seems like uh, very small numbers, but at the time seemed uh, incredibly large for our goals, uh, that we ran out of extraction kits, uh, or at least we're very close to it. 
And we literally had, we, and we found, happened to find one with a, with a, a business that happened to have some extraction kits that it was not planning to, do, to use. And one of our staff literally jumped in their car, drove down across the county lines to go pick them up, put them back in his car and drive to the state lab. Because if he didn't do that, uh, the state lab may not have been able to keep testing that weekend. Um, so those periods of shortage uh, and trying to prepare for them and try to anticipate them in the future uh, where we don't uh, assume that uh, supply chains and other things will be in place for us and the agility uh, that we needed to develop as a state uh, to be able to look for alternative resources. Our, our state purchasing team uh, became experts in contacting China and uh, working out special deliveries and private planes that were fly, flying across the ocean to try to bring back uh, resources uh, to try to figure out how to continue to supply a state when the entire world was looking for all of the same resources. Um, so our teams uh, became a lot more agile in that and our processes. Uh, we always had looked at our requests for bids and other process to be month long, uh, even dragging out to a greater part of a year to go through. And we developed uh, shortened processes where we could still do public notice on those and uh, do emergency purchases in order to bring in resources quickly to help us to respond to the crisis. Uh, so that was one of the things that, that we've learned as we've gone through this and hopefully can retain some of that agility as we uh, plan and prepare for future events. One of the other things that's unique about our response, Utah is uh, the youngest state in the nation. And so uh, our focus on kids and schools uh, was something that was uh, early on a high priority for us. Uh, last year, as we went back to school, uh, we started in-person school heavily uh, at the beginning of, of the year last year and had many stops and starts uh, as, as schools reached uh, certain infection levels and went back virtually again. We implemented some testing strategies to try to help support that uh, early on. One of them was uh, something that we call test to play, uh, where we were testing uh, athletes and participants in extracurricular activities. Uh, every other week uh, to, uh, and they were encouraged to participate in that because they needed those in order to continue with those activities. And so we saw that as a, a large draw for students to come in and get tested and that helped us identify uh, infections in our schools and keep them out. We also had a, a developed another process that we call test to stay, which is when a school reaches a certain threshold rather than uh, necessarily closing the school or going virtual that we can just conduct a mass testing event of all of the entire student body. Uh, and those that are positive obviously need to stay home, uh, but then those that uh, have a negative test can continue in-person learning. Uh, so we use those uh, processes to try to keep our schools open and in-person learning going as long and as much as possible. We feel like that's an important part of the overall health of our state and of our students uh, that the in-person learning, uh, although there, we've made great advances in virtual learning, uh, it is just not, not the same for our students and that to, to the extent possible, we are seeking to promote and support in-person learning. Uh, we're going to be facing some different challenges this year as we go into this. Uh, we're starting this uh, fall school year. Our state passed a law that said uh, school districts could not implement mass mandates. Uh, so we're working through how we how we uh, keep our schools safe uh, and open during this process without having uh, those tools on a from a local uh, school district availability. Our law does allow that uh, local health departments or the state health department can implement statewide or local mandates uh, for their individual communities. And so we're going through those discussions. Some communities have implemented those. Uh, others have tried and had those overturned by their county commissions. So it's, uh, we'll be going through that process as a state of figuring out how, how school looks like uh, in that environment. Uh, we are continuing the test to stay model. Uh, so as schools uh, reach higher infection levels, we will be doing those school-wide tests in order to uh, root out uh, the infections that are there and hopefully uh, allow those that are not infected to continue going to school. Um, lastly, before we turn it over to the, the broader discussion, I also wanted to mention the focus that our state has had on the economic portion of this process all the way through. Uh, in March 2020, in one of the earliest plans that the state released uh, related to this in the Utah Leads Together plan, uh, there was actually an economic component that was part of the original plan from the state. 
uh, our unified command leadership for the state um, and had three individuals involved, the health department director, public safety commissioner, and the lead from the, our University of Utah Business School uh, were all part of our unified command. And one of the state's two metrics uh, through the pandemic, so we had a look at mortality as a health metric, but we also had a look at our unemployment numbers as being the two primary metrics that we focused on uh, as we were going through this entire uh, response and had economic metrics as part of that response too, where we're looking at uh, the Utah Consumer Confidence uh, Index and other metrics to see um, how the state was doing, uh, not only on the health metrics, but also on the indicators of how business was doing, how employment was doing, uh, knowing that that was also part of the, the broader health of what our state needed to be doing in this response. Thank you, Nate. Um, I know we're gonna dig into this a little bit more during the discussion. Um, I'm gonna turn back to you, um, Mary Lou. You know, you and Massachusetts have been investing um, before the pandemic in behavioral health and trying to improve that in, in the state of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, excuse me. Um, what have been the impacts of COVID-19 on behavioral health and, and um, what steps are you taking now to really expand upon the work you'd already started? Thank you. And um, I just wanna, uh, let me start that building off how Nate talked about schools, um, because one of the impacts of this pandemic uh, on all of us, but particularly on kids, and in Massachusetts, actually, all of our schools, um, except for parochial schools um, and some independent schools, all closed um, pretty much for the year uh, and opened very late, like in May of this uh, last year. And the impact of social isolation, uh, anxiety. Um, honestly, um, there's gonna be something called like pandemic post-traumatic stress disorder, I think, um, on kids. Uh, uh, we will not see the full effects of this. And so one of our strategies coming into, now, I, I will pivot quickly to behavioral health, but one of our strategies as we thought coming into fall was to do everything possible to have our schools, our K through 12 open safely um, and with whatever tools they need. So we've rolled out um, three different kinds of testing for our schools. So our so we've mandated that all our schools K through 12 have to be open. Um, we did impose a uh, universal masking in schools um, for at least through October as uh, we rolled out pool testing, a test and stay, uh, also, plus uh, diagnostic and contact tracing testing. So schools can pick at state expense um, um, us to support them staying open. Um, behavioral health has been, so that's, so part of our, in supporting children and resilience uh, and positive um, behavioral health uh, is for us to have schools open and kids back in school being kids learning and being with their, their, um, their friends and teachers. Um, behavioral health uh, for us has been, you know, I'm lucky to have a governor who, when he speaks about health care, um, he speaks about both physical and behavioral health care. So, um, so since 2015, Governor Baker uh, has made uh, strong in, inroads in behavioral health, which is, again, it's great to have a governor who talks about health care as a whole person health care. Um, we rolled out legislation uh, that was pretty bold. Uh, in 2019, bad timing on our part because the pandemic was right around the corner. So that legislation uh, was not enacted, which made big improvements in behavioral health and primary care. But during the pandemic, we pivoted one of those many um, public health governor's orders and public health orders was we pivoted very quickly to telebehavioral health and honestly was godsend in Massachusetts. We also, a uh, little controversial to some in insurance orders, um, we required during the public health emergency that telehealth visit visits were um, reimbursed uh, the same as in-person visits. Uh, part of it was messaging to the public that this was not a lesser service. Um, and then worked with the legislature, uh, passing legislation, um, uh, cementing uh, that for telebehavioral health, telebehavioral health is now the law in Massachusetts and requires payment as the same as in-person visits. 
So telebehavioral health became a lifeline for many, many individuals, and the numbers were really quite extraordinary. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had also started a roadmap for behavioral health reform. Uh, we use the term roadmap because roadmaps are, you know, blueprints are subject to change, uh, but it was really engaging with our broader public on opening up of, from prevention uh, to ambulatory care. It's not the entire behavioral health system, but is how do you make it more accessible and available to individuals who are struggling, early, early diagnosis and the like. Um, uh, and that got, the implementation got a little uh, interrupted uh, by the pandemic, but we are now rolling out uh, the roadmap uh, to um, the timing, you know, is good probably because where we are in this, in the pandemic, uh, we've invested $100 million in our community health centers to improve primary care and behavioral health, uh, big, big in our equity communities. Uh, we're one of three states who use, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do Medicaid language here. Um, so we're one of three states that um, uh, uh, using EPSDT um, to allow for um, behavioral health treatment without a formal diagnosis for kids, um, which uh, I feel very good about. Uh, again, trying to expand access, um, use some of our ARPA money, but some of our other funds to uh, increase rates uh, because of to deal with the workforce shortage. Those are some short-term fixes, but long-term as we get to filing our 1115 waiver, uh, you will see um, big and bold around uh, behavioral health. Uh, as well as uh, uh, particularly in our equity communities. So for us, the future um, in response to this pandemic, but also just the right thing to do is to really um, build up behavioral health, truly integrate it with primary care and remind people that seeking help is a strength and not a weakness. That's great, and thank you for your leadership on behavioral health. We will be looking at that waiver and, and uh, with great interest uh, to share with other states. Um, Mandy, turning to you, you would start to talk about whole person care and the investments you've made before the pandemic. How has COVID-19 affected that work and where are you now on that path? Yeah, well, um, sometimes in a crisis, you also have opportunity. Um, and I think this is one of the opportunities we took advantage of in North Carolina, the focus on uh, needing these services, which is so apparent, um, needing to think about the whole person differently. And luckily, we had gone down a journey of creating one state platform that linked EHRs to community organizations. So you as a doctor could refer to a food bank, a food bank could tell you what, if that if that patient and their family actually came, got the food that they needed. So it, it was a much closed loop referral. We call it NC Care 360. Um, and prior to the pandemic, it was in about um, 40 of our 100 counties, about 40% of the state. When COVID hit, we accelerated the timeline. And by June of 2020, we were in all 100 um, counties, which means we onboarded uh, all of our community organizations really, really quickly onto the platform, our, our hospitals onto it, because we knew it would be this backbone to help do the things we then layered on top using recovery dollars. So the layer on layers on top became um, a, a large community health worker program to link folks to the resources that we were putting in place and navigating. So they used the platform and we, again, the data that we got from that allowed us to like make really targeted investments. It it showed us right away where was there a housing need versus a food security need. Um, so we layered on um, uh, a community health worker program with about um, 450 um, community health workers. And I would say we are then, we are as we hopefully move away from, from COVID, we are already transitioning that program to and extending it um, to be able to not just do COVID, but, but move beyond. The, and in addition, then you actually have to pay for additional resources and community. So we launched an isolation support program um, where if folks met certain um, income uh, thresholds and were participating through our community health worker program, we would do income replacement. We would do food delivery. 
and, and any other wraparound services, but certainly the income replacement for folks was the biggest because a lot of, of, of folks who needed to isolate either because they were positive or exposed um, were, were gig workers. You don't work, you don't get paid. And it was a, you know, it was a choice basically between, how, the, it, was, it was a false choice um, for folks. So um, we launched that wraparound support program in um, 12 uh, uh, of, 12 areas of our state. It covered about 40% of the state. So we didn't do it everywhere. But what that actually allowed us to do was like be very targeted, again, to historically marginalized communities, um, under-resourced communities, and be really targeted with where we use our community health center. And we sort of layered things on. And I think that's a takeaway here is that there's no one solution. It is really about layers in data infrastructure and the technology, the people infrastructure of, of community health workers, and then paying for the resources, food, housing, transportation. Um, uh, so those are the kinds of things that we layer together. And then we use Medicaid dollars in addition to, you know, some of our recovery dollars. We, we then think about how do we use our Medicaid dollars to sort of further this. Both we, we now pay for um, social determinant screening. We don't call it that here, but we, we, we will not pay, pay for that. Um, as I mentioned, the equity payments that we are making um, that allow for um, more of this. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to now transition away from just using recovery dollars, but thinking about how do we make this sustainable over the long term um, as, we, as we go into that. But I will say, even with the recovery dollars, we have a great opportunity here. And I think all states do to look at those dollars to think about how do you lay some of this infrastructure now with, with uh, around your data infrastructure with w things like community health worker programs and equity investments that will sustain you well beyond COVID. And so we're really trying to think about both the short-term need that we can pay for like income replacement, as well as those long-term more sustainable data infrastructure um, or other types of programmatic things that will live beyond COVID. Thank you. And I, I think we're going to um, follow your investments in SDOH using ARPA and sustainable plan through Medicaid with great interest. And, and I know a number of states have been asking about, you know, how's North Carolina doing? They, they were ahead of the game with their waiver on SDOH and um, now they're making more progress. So, so I know we'll be circling back. We're, after we're in the midst of it right now. So yeah. we're, we've launched the, um, the work through our Medicaid um, uh, pilots. And so we're just at the beginning of collecting some of that data. So stay tuned. Okay. Thank you. Um, Nate, so you really talked about how are we gonna be prepared for the next pandemic, um, knowing that um, we were not um, across the states, across the country, across the world. Um, from your perspective, what's next for Utah and where, where do you feel like um, you're, you're on the path to, to being prepared and, and recovering? Yeah, thanks, Hemi, for that question. Before I jump into that, I do uh, appreciate North Carolina and Secretary Collins' lead on the referral platform. Uh, that has really been something that uh, our state's been looking at and interested in seeing how we might be able to copy or bring over that concept and use that here. And we really uh, have appreciated their work there. And also on Secretary Sutter's comment about telehealth, uh, that has been a lifesaver here in Utah also. And as we've been developing this through the pandemic, one of the areas where we've made a change for the pandemic and we're looking to see if we're going to be able to keep that change is that in addition to telehealth, uh, we've also been doing uh, services through the telephone. Uh, so just uh, not doing the, the visual part, but actually just doing a phone call as part of the service model uh, and seeing how that uh, may or may not be able to continue or if we can support that post pandemic. I uh, appreciate the question about how do we uh, prepare for the next one and how do we respond. Uh, one of the things that we've been uh, very uh, concerned about or uh, interested in how we can continue to develop is, is related to our workforce. Uh, we know that this pandemic has gone on for a long time and uh, many of our staff have been in the throes of this for 18 plus months. Uh, some of our staff report in on the daily calls day 565, day 560, and that they've been at this straight going at this, and it's taking a toll. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, individuals in our, in our teams uh, starting to report that uh, they are suffering from, from being on, on demand, on call uh, for this long period. And so how do we sustain and support them for the long term? 
so that they can uh, remain with us and find some uh, balance that they have not been able to have for the last 18 months. Uh, one of the things that we've been looking into and are starting to implement is a peer support program, uh, that this is something we've seen that has worked in some other departments in our state uh, and be able to help our staff be able to work more closely with each other and uh, share their experiences uh, and their challenges uh, related to this. Uh, we're also looking for, uh, we're also seeking some additional funds that would help us do some statewide training uh, related to mental health for our, our employees and uh, healthcare workers, uh, as we know that they've been on, on call for a long time related to this uh, and need some additional supports and skills to be able to, to work through this on, on a long-term basis. I think we face one of the challenges that all states face right now, that there is a lot of federal dollars coming in that are short-term in nature. And so our teams are significantly expanded right now because of those federal funds. So our testing teams, our contact tracing teams, our administrative support teams, uh, but those dollars will go away here in the near future. And uh, as we look to plan about how we will support these types of activities in the, in the future, we know that we don't need to have, or we hope, we hope that uh, we won't need these size of teams uh, maybe in the next year or two years. We don't know when that time frame is, but we hope that we can return to a smaller response, uh, but still be able to have what we're trying to develop is that balance of having a core team uh, that would be on hand, trained uh, and ready that if the next uh, pandemic type experience calls on for a significant response, that those trained and experienced individuals would know how to bring on um, 10 testing teams and train them and get them ready and going and quickly get them out into the field, that they would know how to bring up a call center um, and bring in those uh, external contracts to bring in and contract that employees to uh, uh, supplement the state efforts. Uh, so we have a public health roadmap that uh, we've developed that includes uh, both systematic uh, changes and support so that our IT systems are better able to receive and exchange data uh, but also these staffing plans about what would our core staff look like and what would that need to be to be able to quickly flex and agilely respond to a future uh, pandemic. Thank you for sharing that and um, and really recognizing sort of the stress and, and the challenges that the public health workforce and the broader state workforce has been under for the past 18 months. Um, you know, I think we've been hearing that from across the state. So Utah's not alone in that. And really um, look forward to, to seeing how your investments um, really help the staff and what else we can share with other states. So we are um, nearing our time um, to end this discussion. I wish we had another hour. There's so much to learn from each and every one of you. Um, I know this has been uh, a really difficult 18 months, but I've been so impressed just to hear about how um, the lessons learned that you've um, gleaned from this and where you're continuing to make investments. Um, in the last um, couple minutes that we have, we can do a lightning round. Any last um, words or thoughts for the audience um, about kind of where we are and what's next? Um, whoever wants to go first, um, please go ahead. Mary Lou. <laughs> I'll go first. Oh, you'll go first. I, I was going to say, you know, I know there's a lot of state leaders who are listening in right now. And what I would want to make sure is that we, we are taking care of ourselves as well, because this has been an incredibly hard 18 months, a lot of stress on all of us and our systems, our teams. Um, we, we really try to encourage folks to take time off during the summer summer to recharge if you haven't had a chance to do that to do it to we talked about organizational trauma that we have all been through a trauma together i know mayor lou's talking about it for the population but we've been through it as well um, and we are very intentionally bringing up those conversations with our own internal team to say we've been through a lot together and i think even just acknowledging that yeah. we've been through this collective trauma it, it isn't it of self kind of a, a, a sigh that everyone can can kind of come together and, and understand it. So I do I do worry about our own resilience um, as a team. So think about your own, what you can do to be fostering that um, for your team so that we can accomplish all the great, wonderful thing we've all been talking about today, but we need a resilient workforce in order to do it. So take care of yourselves and your team. Yeah. Thank you. Who's next? Yes. Um, so one of the things I would just, uh, in addition to saying ditto, is one of the things I say to my staff is 
we're only as good as taking care of others if we take care of ourselves. And it has been, you know, 19 months of being sort of hyper vigilant. Um, and that comes at a uh, personal cost as we think about resilience. But the one thing I would say is, so we are, as we think through the next few months uh, and years, and every time I start to, I think I can start to bridge um, either out of contact tracing or out of something, um, I'm reminded that this pandemic is evolving. Uh, and so I think what I would suggest to everyone is we take a breath at this time um, as we double down on vaccines and and giving and creating a space for our economy and uh, to open in whatever shape that looks like and having the capacity to pivot and be nimble in response to whatever um, continues as we manage our way um, through COVID-19, because I don't think we'll be eradicating COVID-19. It'll be living with COVID-19 and how we talk about that in the future will be very important. Yes, thank you. And Nate, you get the last word. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to echo a point that Secretary Cohen made earlier related to our, our broader healthcare workforce and the tremendous job that they've done uh, in responding to this and that they continue to face uh, that as their work as our nurses and doctors are working in long-term care facilities and hospitals and clinics, uh, they continue to face extreme challenges and uh, you know, they need our thanks, they need our support. Uh, and um, it's something I think that we can't, can't do too much uh, as we express our support for them on a regular basis for that frontline work that they have done from day one related to this. And in many cases have not had um, any real break in this process as they've had consistent demands on them and, and the types of demands that they've been facing with these very challenging situations. So I just want to acknowledge uh, their work in this this process, and uh, my my thanks for that. Well, a good note to end on. Um, thank you to all of you for this really incredible discussion. I know um, we will be following up with each and every one of you to share um, what you're learning and continuing on your journey with other states. So, um, for the audience, stay tuned for our next session. Um, we look forward um, to virtually seeing you for the rest of today for our conference. Um, thanks again, everybody. Bye.